Hi, I'm Bernie Flynn. At New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, MagnaCare, New Jersey City University, NJCU, Success Spoken Here, Investors Bank, NJM, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree. And by ShopRite Supermarkets. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One. We are honored, absolutely honored, to be joined by uh, Bobby Rydell, singer, actor, <laughs> uh, entertainer, a very special guy, author of the book, Teen Idol on the Rocks. A tale of second chances all the way from South Philly. South Philly. Let's tell people, this is no joke. Take a look at this, guys. You see this over here? Yeah. It is, why am I it's, making this joke? It's an Italian thing. It, why? Where, who well, used to have this? My grandmother. My grandmother. Uh, uh, okay. Was your grandmother's name Lena by any chance? No, Vincenza. Oh, Vincenza. Vincenza my, from, from Lina Naples. Lena Sapienza was my grandmother. Vincenza Cavallo. Oh, God. Oh, nice. And, and by the way, are you upset that we don't have plastic on these? Of course, my grandmother would be very upset. <laughs> now, why did, why did our people have plastic on the furniture? You know, I really don't know. I, to to uh, preserve it. <laughs> it made no sense. It was very comfortable, too, in the summer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, by the well, way, too, Bobby, well, tell everyone nice to sit on. <laughs> uh, your original name? Roberto Luigi Riderelli. If you want to say it in American, it's Robert Louis Ritterelli. Beautiful. Italian, Roberto Luigi Ritterelli. Mezza Bruzzese, Mezza Marcagian. So both. Yeah. My father was a, a Marcagian, and my mother's side was from Abruzzi. Abruzzi. Provincia di Campo Basso. That's the province. Yeah. Beautiful. He's an idiot. I'll interpret for people. Um, <laughs> you've had an amazing career. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Um, when did you know that you, and when did others around you know that you had this talent to perform, to sing. It goes back a long time, Steve. Uh, when my dad was overseas, I was three years old, and my mom and dad would write back and forth. And my mom would write, the baby's always singing, the baby's <laughs> always singing. God's honest truth. And my father wrote back, I, I still have the letter today in, in, in my house back home in Philly. And my father wrote back, who knows, maybe one day we'll have a star in the family. Is that right? Absolutely. And if I had any talent within me whatsoever, my dad was the first one to see it. He used to take me around to small clubs in Philadelphia when I was seven, eight years old. Mm. Asked the club owner, is it okay if my son gets up and sings and does a couple of uh, imitations? Mm. And, you know, when you're a young kid, you know, it's like a, a child act or an animal act. You know, people yes. applaud. I said, wow, all I have to do is do this and they do that. What a wonderful feeling. So that, that, it's been my life. That's all, that's all I've known since about, you know, seven years old. But who discovered you? at okay. first and really realized that professionally you could make some money. Matter of fact, a very dear friend of mine, Frankie Avalon, was in a band called uh, Rocco. The Frankie Avalon. The Frankie Avalon, yes, Avalon. And that Funicello and Frankie Avalon. Yeah, the, all of the, I beach, sorry, I all of the beach movies. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Frank and I go back, Frankie and I go back, I call him Cheech in Italian, you know. And, um, not Don Cheech. Not Don Cheech. Not Don no. Cheech. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, it's, I, it's too, it's, it's, don't the, I was going to go there. Will you give me a few minutes? Excuse it. Excuse it. Give me a few minutes before I go there. Hey. Stop. Ashpet. I spent already. As you were saying. No fuss, <laughs> combari. But uh, as you were saying. Yeah. Uh, on the armor, let's go. <laughs> so with the, so with the. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Frankie, uh, we go back. I was 10 years old. Frankie was 40. No, I'm only. <laughs> <laughs> I was 10. Frankie's a couple of years older than me. 
So uh, he was in a band called Rockin' with the Saints, and he said, Bobby, Chippy Broncata, the drummer, got sick. He said, could you come in and fill in? Because I've been playing drums since I was five, right. six years old. So I said, yeah, Frank, you know, so I go down. And the head group, uh, the main group was a band called Billy Duke and the Dukes. And we were the, like, the second part. We were Rocco and the Saints. But I was only in for the night. And the bass player in Rocco and the Saints was a guy by the name of Frankie Day. His real name, Francesco Cocchi. Wow. And he came up to me and he said, I was like 15 years old. He says, I'd like to manage you. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, talk to my father. My, my dad was with me, and we shook hands. No, no signing of a contract, and uh, we went around to different recording companies and got this and yes. this and this. I said, this is really not for me. I was really happy playing drums. And then we went back to Philadelphia, met a man by the name of Bernie Lowe, who was the president of Cameo, which later became Cameo Parkway, recorded three songs, had nothing, I said, this is really not for me. And then my first hit was a song called Kissin' Time, summer of 1959. Basically, Steve, that's how it all started. So hold on. Let's yeah. fast forward a little bit. Sure. You and Ann Margaret, 1963. A lot happens between 59 and 63. But you and Ann Margaret, Bye Bye Birdie, 1963. 63. Correct. You go Peabody. Yes. That's you. Well, you know, I went out and I screen tested with Ann for George Sidney, who was the director. And basically a screen test. They roll film. They want to see what kind of a personality he Did have. you want to be an actor? Not really. Okay. No, not really. I but just, you were hot at the time. Oh, I was very hot you at the time. You had to be real hot to even uh, for, for them to look at you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was, so I went out and I screen tested. And Anne was with me, and we read some lines from the script. We sang, you know, she did one boy, one special, what one girl, one special, good, yada, yada, yada. And go home. And <clears throat> my manager, Frankie Day, he calls, he says, you landed the part of Hugo Peabody. And that was it. Now, I went to see the Broadway show. And prior, you know, to go out and screen test, and Hugo and Peabody and the Broadway show, the legitimate show, did nothing. He didn't sing, he didn't dance, he didn't, he didn't have a line. And I guess Mr. Sidney, George Sidney, saw some kind of magic between Ann Margaret and myself, and every day I would go to the studio on set, and the script got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with lines and dancing and singing and so on. It was, you know, I, I, I've never made that many movies, but if I had to make one movie, I mean, Bye Bye Birdie is a classic, you know, such as Grease. Was she amazing? Anne was great, you know. Matter of fact, uh, I sent her my book and she called me. And I was working a place in uh, Florida called uh, the, uh, the uh, Villages. Really, really super place. And I was in the shower, the phone rang, I pick it up, and it's voicemail. And she says, that's not your name. Your name is Ridarelli, or Hugo. And she says, Bobby, I just read your book. I can't believe everything that you went through. And she's, she's a sweetheart. And yeah. as I was leaving, I had to leave out of the Orlando airport, I called her. And I said, thank you ever so much, Anne. I said, I really appreciate it. And I said, you know what? Back in 1963, I was 20, you were 21. Why didn't we get mad? <laughs> Why didn't we get mad? <laughs> Could you do this for us? The Darkest Times. Well, it, <laughs> there, were, there were many. I guess the darkest time was when I lost my first wife, and that was uh, 2003, and she passed away via breast cancer. And uh, we were married for 36 years, Steve, had two children. And when she died, I mean, there was a void that, uh, I mean, there was, there was nobody in bed, there was nobody to talk to, there was nobody to laugh with, there was nobody to cry with, and I, I became an alcoholic. You I did. Mean, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, a bad, uh, not a bad drug, but I mean, just bad, bad, bad drinking. I mean, to the point where I would hide bottles in my golf bag, in the trunk of my car. God forbid half of the bottle was going in the refrigerator and I'd have to go, you know, to the state store or liquor store buy, you know, another bottle. God forbid. You know, How did you know you had a problem? I'm sorry? How did you know you had a problem? I didn't. Who told you? My new wife. Uh, we're married seven years now, and uh, thank God if it wasn't for her, you know, I, I don't think I'd be sitting talking with you right now. Uh, 
she, she had an intervention, you know, and, uh, and that kind of like uh, put me on the straight and narrow, you know, to the point where, I mean, I was so bad, as it says in the book, you, you know. You had a double transplant. I had a double transplant, a, a, a new liver and a new kidney, yeah. I was about a week to 10 days away from, from dying. That's it? Yeah. That's you? That picture? That's me. How oh, isn't this great? I, I love that. That you know, if I can just interject, right. you know, there's no hair. Okay, this is you got a beautiful head. That's that's a that's a hair piece. It's a nice it is hair. Not. Yes, it's a hair piece. But we're doing a show about six months later, have a meet and greet, and this elderly lady comes up with old forty fives and some old eight by tens, and she said, Bobby. God bless you. I'm so happy you came through your surgery with flying colors. I said, thank you ever so much. She said, may I ask you a question? I said, absolutely. She says, I didn't know they shaved your head for transplant surgery. <laughs> I see how said, your hair grew back. I, I, <laughs> I said, sweetheart, this is a hair piece. What are you, you going to tell them that for? Why not? Who cares? Hmm? Zit? Exactly. But, but who cares, really? I, come on, we're vain. We care. Uh, no. You, boy, you put it all out there. <laughs> you, you're better than I am. You ready? Um, I went to Yeah, because you've got all of that. <laughs> How about this? You ready? Hello. Some friends that were a little... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you knew them and had to deal with them. Yeah. How? Why they leave... How did they leave you... Okay, they didn't leave you alone because you worked in the clubs and you knew these guys. Yes. How did you manage your interactions with them? Uh, I'm not going to start mentioning names. It's, you don't in the, need to. it's in the book, but I, I was having I was having dinner with this particular gentleman and two of his uh, associates. Associates, and we're sitting at a restaurant in Brooklyn, and he says to me, "Bobby," he said, "You could have been a big star." He says, "Sinatra loves you." I said, "I love him too, Louis." Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave and, it at that. Go ahead. And he said something to the effect that... There's you and Sinatra right there. Yeah, wow. That was 19 years old. That was at the oh Copa. You Copa got to be me. Oh, yeah. go ahead. He was sitting with Sammy Kahn, Jimmy Van Usen, Richard Conti, and Joe DiMaggio. Stop it. Yeah. And Jules Padel, who was the yes. owner of the Copa, the Copa, he was about four foot five, had no neck, talk like this, right? And he hits Frank on the shoulder. He says, Frank, I want you to meet the kid. You're the and kid. And Sinatra turned around. He said, how you doing, Robert? Called me Robert. Oh, my God. I said, fine, Mr. Sinatra. How are you? Wonderful. Would you care to join us? I said, it would be my pleasure. And a couple of minutes go by, and he turns to me. He says, uh, what do you drink, Robert? I said, Coke. <laughs> <laughs> I figure if I said scotch of water, I get smacked in the face. You know. That's, that's amazing. But anyway, you know, this particular gentleman said that uh, been big. my father more or less yes. messed up my career. And I looked at him, and I called him an effing liar. Well, his eyes went like this. He got up. He left the table. These two guys say, you don't call him. A... Yes. I said, he's talking about my father, my family. He's a liar. And now there's silence. <laughs> I said, oh, my God. Is the Hudson come into mind? You know, swimming with the fishes, concrete Komoda type of thing. But this particular gentleman came back, hugged me, kissed me. Because he said somebody, your father, he, he respected you. Of course, you. I, took up, I, I, yeah. I took up for family. Before I let you go, you're still performing today. Yes, sir. How young are you? I'm 74. I just turned 74, wow. April 26th. How the yeah. hell you look like this? You well, look tremendous. I'm new liver, new kidney. No, but you're still performing. <laughs> you're, you're still oh, packing I like, them in. Uh, How? Why? Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, after the surgery, you know, or prior to the surgery, you know, you're going to have tubes and this and that. Am I going to be able to do what I've done all my life? Because I really, really enjoy what I'm doing. It's not a job. I love what I'm doing. Right. And I was so happy that six months after the double transplant, I was in Vegas. You know, and it felt so good, Steve. It, you know, of course, I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to do that again. What's it like being on that stage again? Ju ju I am so fortunate. I am so lucky. I mean, I, you know, the way it happened, the way this whole thing happened with me, with the transplant, and everything is in the book, uh, was like a miracle. 
I, I, you know, I'm all positive. My daughter was 21 years old, hit by a car in Reading. She was all positive. That's how things worked out. When I got the liver, I talked to the doctor who, uh, who put in my, my kidney, Dr. Romero's, and Dr. Cataldo Doria put in my liver. I said, I didn't know that I, I wasn't the primary mm. recipient. He looked at me, he said, Bobby, he said, you aren't even the secondary. I said, what do you mean? He said, there were 14 people in front of you waiting for a new liver. Oh 14 people, Steve, turned down a partial liver. I split, I split my liver with a little four-year-old girl. Her name is Saya from Philadelphia. She got 25% of Julia's liver. I got 75% of Julia's liver. I mean. You believe in God? Absolutely. Thought so? Absolutely. I was an altar boy for five years. Join the club. That's when they did it in Latin. Yeah, join the club. <laughs> um, Bobby Rydell, otherwise known as Robert. Robert Roberto Luigi Riderelli. <laughs> Teen Idol on the Rocks, a tale of second chances. We are honored um, that we are joined by um, this extraordinary entertainer and American icon all the way from South Philly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bobby. My pleasure, Steve. Right Thank there. you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And every now and again, a new talent comes along. Watch this man. He's going to be off the bay. This is Bobby Rydell. Wow. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. You ever ask somebody from New Jersey for directions and you get this answer? Well, I know how to get there, but I don't know how to tell you how to do it. <laughs> See, a lot of people don't believe I'm Italian because typically I don't look it. I'm actually light skinned and I have blue eyes. But I can tell you people in this room right now, I'm a full blood Italian, but my parents were born in Italy and I could prove it. <laughs> I'm 45 years old, and I still live at home with my mom. There he is, Mike Marino, stand-up comedian who is uh, performing all over the country and making a lot of people laugh. Good to see you, Mike. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's our honor, our pleasure. Um, <clears throat> when did you know that you were funny? You know, I, I didn't ever really set out to be a comedian. All my life, I wanted to be an actor. You know, I grew up doing uh, plays in school, in high school. And, Where? Uh, I went to, uh, I was born in Jersey City. I used to imitate TV commercials. And then when I moved to Scotch Plains, uh, in like uh, grammar school and high school, I was involved in the plays all the time. Then around 16, 17 years old, I started going to New York and I started doing TV commercials. I never really wanted to be funny. I thought I was going to be the next Robert De Niro. Mm. It wasn't until I around maybe 25, I moved to California, and they kept saying, you know, you Jersey people, the way you talk, the way you act, it's so funny. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm not funny. I'm like funny like hell, like a clown, yeah, like, like I make you laugh. Like I amuse you. <laughs> like I amuse you. <laughs> it's kind of true. But then I figured, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So I started cracking jokes in clubs. And before you know it, I started getting acting work <clears throat> from doing stand-up. So really? it's kind of one of the same, in a way. Just performing. It's performing. It's what it is. I love performing. There's no greater high than a live performance. What about it? You, you just, um, I think I did a show maybe uh, a couple of months ago, maybe 3,000 people just screaming, having a good time. And, and, and I, I finished the show and everybody was happy and I walked outside and one of the radio announcers uh, from a station in California said to me, what does that feel like? And I go, Picture the greatest food you've ever had, the greatest sexual experience you ever had, maybe the greatest drug you've ever done. Put it all together, that's what that feels like. It's like that. And you have to have it all the time now. You're addicted to it. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> so that being said, um, one of the first ways I got to know you, I mean, YouTube's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yes, very powerful. So one of the first times I saw you, and people were telling me about you, uh, you and just a couple other people, Sebastian Maniscalco, a couple Sebastian. other people, it's really terrific. We just had our... Vic DiBattetto was on recently. Yes. But you, great comedian. He's great. But you, I said, this guy's incredible. It was the Bin Laden sketch. Right. Tell people about that because it changed your world. 
Well, I had been coming up with uh, jokes about, you know, whacking people in foreign countries, and if I was the president, what I would do. And, right. and some of those sketches I actually was doing on The Tonight Show as sketch comedy right. when Jay was on the show. So I would do them live in the club, and um, when I went on the Byron Allen show, Comics Unleashed, I just decided I'm going to do it today. And the audience was going with it, the live audience, that, and, and they started cheering. So all of a sudden I said, you know what, I'm going to stand up. So I stood up, and everybody was cheering, and I did the joke. Tell everybody what it is. And I said, you know, if, if we had uh, uh, an Italian president running a country, we wouldn't, wouldn't send the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps to find Osama bin Laden. Two Italians from Jersey would be back in 24 hours. They'd have walked into his cave, they'd have made him an offer and said, you know what, we got to talk about something. And they'd have took care of it. Then they went home with a couple extra rugs. <laughs> and it just went worldwide, and it went worldwide very fast. So after it hit like two, three million views on YouTube, sponsors started dropping in. And they would say, okay, you know, um, Adidas, uh, Nike, uh, TGI Fridays, and they started putting their ads on the spot. So then I started getting phone calls from, let's say, a casino, a theater, uh, places I've always wanted to play, a lot of Canada. Really? And when you show up, there's thousands of people. Now, they want to see the one joke that you did. Yes. They want to hear you do that joke. However, you do have to do an hour. So luckily, I can do an hour show, hour and 15 minutes. Sometimes I'll do an hour and a half by myself and home run. Now the clip is up to 8 million. 8 million? 8 million. And oh, it's, check and it out Mike, you can going. see it. Um, and sorry for interrupting. You make fun of and enjoy talking about growing up Italian. Oh, yes. Because? Because I am. <laughs> I am. And what is real is always going to be funny. I know you're Italian, and I know you were talking to Bobby Rydell about being Italian in the plastic yeah. couches, and, and it's true. And what's true is always going to be funny. I grew up in the basement. We never ate upstairs. That was for the, the, the relatives or the better people. Company. We ate downstairs. It was for the company. company. We got company company, clean your feet and go downstairs, wake your father and boil the water now. You know, all these classic stuff. You grew up with that. It's true. And it makes it funny. It makes it good for uh, sitcoms let, and television. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, one of the things I also pick up from watching you uh, on video is the, the question is, does New Jersey get a bad rap? I don't think it gets a bad rap. Or is it who we are? Rap. Yeah. Is it, it who is we are? who we are. I think it is. Who I are mean, we? My persona, my Jersey persona in Texas goes over tremendous. Um, California, all around the world. You know, I'm getting ready to go to Australia. I'm going to perform in Dubai. I performed in Japan. People have an affection for people, let's say, like us, who are from New Jersey, have a little bit of an edge, an attitude, or maybe we're connected, maybe we're not connected, you know, that type of a thing. And it works. There's you know, nothing you can do about it. Connected or not connected. It's yeah. interesting how you say I'm a little that. disconnected, but yes, I think I understand. if you know what... So let me ask you, we're doing this in, as we go into the summer of 2016, and it'll be seen after. You've got political views. I really do. Like, you do? Like a lot of people. Um, and you consider yourself someone who has the potential to be president. Right. Because? Because I have 8 million views on YouTube. <laughs> now, if I can get 8 million views on YouTube, I can get 8 million votes. Get so if you were president, yes. tell us some things that would happen. Well, the first thing I'd do, I'd relocate the White House from Washington to New Jersey. Who's going to find us? <laughs> Especially off the parkway at the turnpike. Forget right. It. We can close down a bridge in no time. Oh, stop. I you, didn't you, stop. I can't, I just... I can't believe you went there. <laughs> so I thought that's where you were going. No, no, I was not going there. All right, then we'll um, take it back. No, you can't take it back. You already said it. But what else would you do? Seriously, what, what would be some of the priorities if you were president? Well, like I said, you know, I, I think uh, I'd go in there with some different personnel. You know, they go in there with the vice president and the, who's in charge of the state. I go in there with Nikki, Joey, Petey, Salvi, Tom, uh, Bob, downtown Ronnie. You bring guys like this That's in there to cabinet? help you out. That's my cabinet. No diversity? I bring my mom in, so the food is different, <laughs> if that's what you mean. Loyalty, though. Very How loyal. How important is loyalty? Oh, you got to stay very loyal. Very loyal. Yeah, my mother knows every move I make. She loves your show, by the way. Does she? Yeah, she would go nuts if she was in this room right now and saw Bobby Rydell. <laughs> yeah, by the way, uh, we should let everyone know the reason Mike's saying is Bobby Rydell was just oh. here. And they saw each other in the green room, and you actually opened up for him. I opened for Bobby Rydell and Dina Martin at a big Italian festival Dina last Martin, summer. Dina Martin, it was uh, Dean Martin's, Dean Martin's daughter. She's, what a great singer she is. Yes. She's terrific. Um, I got to ask you something. I'm curious about this. Do you think there's something about, not just Italian Americans, but Italian Americans from New Jersey? Yes. Something that, I, I know it sounds very inside right now, that, that quote unquote we get. 
were very matter of fact. Yes, it might be in your face, but at least you get the truth the first time. If somebody doesn't like you, you know for sure they don't like you. And if they do, then they're gonna tell you, I love you. And then you know you're loved. You're loved. You go to different places, different parts of the country, you really don't know where you stand. You know. We let you know. And by the way, tell everyone again where they can find you. I am at MikeMarino.net. I tell people all the time they can follow me on Twitter, but I'm Italian, I don't really like being followed. <laughs> Hey, what's Reconstructing Jersey before I let you go? Reconstructing Jersey is a pilot about my Italian family living in a basement in the construction business. Listen, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. It's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, 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 you're good. Mike, listen, I appreciate it. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, MagnaCare, New Jersey City University, Investors Bank, NJM, NJ Best, and by ShopRite Supermarkets. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.